The following interview <coughs> was conducted with Professor Craig A. Bayrody, head of the Department of Agronomy, uh, School of the College of Agriculture at Purdue University, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, April 29, 2009, at his office in Lilly Hall. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good morning. Well, thank you. It's Let's, good to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born and raised in Southern California. I was actually born uh, in Santa Monica and uh, grew up in a town called Westchester, which was not too far away from L.A. International, so that's a good landmark to compare that with. Uh, my uh, parents, my dad was born and raised in California as well. He grew up in Venice, California. Uh, and he was a policeman for Los Angeles and eventually became uh, head of homicide in the Venice Division. Uh, my mother was a homemaker, um, very, very supportive of myself and, and my brother and my sister, and who are all older than me, so I'm the youngest of, of three. Uh, we all went to Catholic school, uh, went to Catholic elementary school, St. Jerome, went to uh, Catholic High School, St. Bernard, which was near Westchester in a town called Playa del Rey, and then ended up going for two years to Loyola University uh, before I decided to transfer to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where that's where I pursued my, my uh, academic degree, my bachelor's degree in soil science. Okay. Tell a little bit about high school. Were there any organizations? And then you can tell a little bit about college, what campus was like, college life. Oh, I was heavily involved at, at high school. I was involved in uh, a number of student organizations, uh, um, uh, certainly uh, a number of sp uh, sporting athletic uh, activities as well. So I was... I was on the cross country team, I was on the basketball team, I was on the track team, uh, did a little bit of soccer while I was there as well. I was in student government, um, I was a, uh, uh, you know, uh, let's see, uh, National Honor Society, I'd have to go back, that's been a long time ago, yeah, Catherine, yeah, but uh, heavily involved um, and, uh, and thoroughly enjoyed high school, still have a, a number of people that I stay in sure. contact with. Um, and so that was actually it was a very uh, uh, important part of my, my formation because there were a number of faculty there and on, in particular these were some of the priests that were there that were uh, um, true role models for me and, and uh, provided me guidance in terms of how I think and how I interact with people and, uh, and treat people. Yeah. Good. Then tell about college. What was your major, and did you live on campus? What was campus like? Well, I did. Uh, now, the first two years I spent at Loyola, right. and I started majoring in philosophy, uh, and I did that for about a year and a half, and then I switched to business, decided that business was not for me. Uh, I really wanted to do something outdoor, and I really wanted to major in forestry, uh, but there were no forestry programs in the Los Angeles area, and I had a good friend that was going to school in forestry at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and he was a high school buddy of mine, and he convinced me that I needed to come to Cal Poly to do that. Well, in the meantime, in order to, uh, I made the decision that I would transfer there, but in the, to save some money, uh, Cal Poly was on the quarter system, Loyola was on the semester system, so they didn't exactly match, but I didn't want to lose out on the timing of school. I left Loyola and I went to UCLA and I took uh, courses there in geology and then also in biology and I indicated to uh, one of my uh, professors, and this was in biology, that I was uh, planning on majoring in forestry. Uh, but it just so happened that, that the forestry program was closed and I was told at Cal Poly that I had three other options to major in that first quarter and then I could move into forestry once the forestry program opened up. Remember this was in the 70s and everybody wanted to be in forestry. Well, the three areas were soil science, ag and biological engineering, and horticulture. And uh, my professor at UCLA recommended that I major in soil science and that I stay in soil science rather than get into forestry because he said that you can, you can get into agriculture, you can get into forestry, you can get into engineering with a soil science background. For uh, soil science, I knew nothing about. I thought it was kind of a I'm not going to say it was a joke, but I, I didn't know that you could actually major in something like that. So I did. I decided, well, almost as a lark, I'll go ahead and major in it with the idea that I'll move over to forestry. I took my first class and it absolutely loved soil science, and I was mesmerized by the, the science associated with this discipline and stayed in it. I, In fact, while I was at Cal Poly, I also, uh, for two summers while I was there, worked for the Soil Conservation Service in Oregon mapping soils. And uh, and then also 
uh, I was involved in a student enterprise project at Cal Poly where I was uh, given a nine acre uh, field of dry land barley to raise and to grow and so I here's a city boy learning how to do agriculture driving tractors and moving irrigation pipe and those kinds of things sure. and so it was a great experience right, yeah, yeah. And then after well then after what came next after you, when you graduated well graduated and this is where I met my my future wife okay. Valerie um, and we've we got married a week after graduation and a week after that uh, I took a job with Castle and Cook Foods in v Southern I Illinois. It brought us out to uh, St. Louis, where we actually lived, and I commuted to Val it's called Valmeyer, Illinois, is the town, and it was uh, 45 acres of mushroom commercial mushroom production underground. It was in a cave operation, and so uh, um, uh, I was fortunate to be offered this position. Castle and Cook is the uh, umbrella organization in which Dole. Is, is a subsidiary, or at least it was back then. And so I was really working for Castle and Cook, but these were dole mushrooms. And I was doing research on this mushroom farm. And uh, Valerie was working in a hospital uh, as a nutritionist in uh, St. Louis. And we did that for about a year, and we both decided, you know, we could do this for the rest of our lives, or we could go back to school and enhance our education and then maybe even go back to, for her, the hospital, and for me, uh, 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 industry, the private sector. But we both felt like we needed an advanced degree. And so uh, uh, Purdue was the only institution that I even considered. Uh, I had heard about Purdue when I was at Cal Poly. A number of my advisors had Purdue connections. They exposed me to Purdue. Um, that was all I could ever talk about. Uh, I contacted Purdue while I was in St. Louis. Uh, they invited me up, the, co the uh, Department of Agronomy, uh, to look at their, their, their organization and to explore opportunities here. Uh, and it just so happened I got connected with George Van Skoyek, Jim Ulrichs, and Bill McPhee. And they talked about uh, the teaching opportunities, in particular in soil science. I had an undergraduate in soil science. These three people just uh, were, were very charismatic and, uh, and uh, it looked like a wonderful opportunity. So we left St. Louis, I quit my job, Valerie quit hers, and we came up here and, and uh, this is where I ended up uh, working primarily with George. He was my major advisor uh, and George is still in the department and uh, uh, ended up getting both my master's and PhD here. In the meantime, Valerie came and she ended up going to uh, St. Elizabeth School of Nursing and this is where she got her nursing diploma, her RN, and ended up working for St. Elizabeth's during the, the, the years that we were here. Sure. Yeah. Um, do you have, did you have any children while you were here? We had one. Oh, okay. Aaron, who is our oldest. Right. and uh, Where about did you live when you were You know, the first year we lived over at Mary Student Housing. Okay. Uh, and after that we bought a home on the north side of town on Charles Street, and it was a one and a half story uh, bungalow it was a wonderful home to raise our our first sure. daughter and we were really proud of it because it was our first home yeah. so yeah and then I would bike into work oh, so it was it was a great location yeah, yeah it wasn't too bad yeah. what uh, then after that did you have any military service at all were you in the service no okay. uh, no although I did uh, I was commissioned uh, to go into the uh, the Coast Guard Academy and this was right after high school and I opted not to accept the commission, so I had gone through the interviews, and I had gone through the physical, and I had passed everything, but I decided that uh, the reality of it was military life wasn't for me. Uh, I didn't know how good I would be in terms of taking orders, <laughs> so I became a faculty member instead. <laughs> okay, don't. I'll keep that. Um, your career path before you came to Purdue, talk a little bit about that. Well, after I left here with my Ph.D., I was fortunate to be offered a position at the University of Arkansas. And there were, there were a couple of qualities that that institution was looking for. Certainly, uh, I think having the degree from Purdue University really helped an awful lot. Purdue carries an awful lot of weight and is highly recognized and highly regarded both nationally and internationally. And, and, uh, and they had hired others from Purdue and felt very comfortable with that. But also, in addition to that, it wasn't so much the science background that they were they were um, drawn to, although that was important, it was the teaching background that I had had. And they were interested in hiring somebody 
who could help direct and lead their introductory soils course uh, and then other courses beyond sure. that. And so that was, that was certainly a strong point as to why I was, I was hired at the University of Arkansas. And I did. I taught a number of courses while I was there. I also had a very strong research program in rice and in cotton. Uh, Arkansas is the number one rice producing state mm-hmm. in the nation. And my focus was looking, my research focus was looking at uh, the root ecology of rice. And I had developed a, uh, a micro video camera technique that would allow me to video record roots growing below ground uh, throughout the season in a non destructive sort of way uh, in order to be able to identify the rate in which roots grow, the depth in which they grew, uh, the density, and, and relate that to above ground growth. And we actually developed. Um, uh, fertilizer and nutrient recommendations based upon some of that. So I'm very proud of the work that, that, that myself and my graduate students and some of the, the faculty uh, did while I was there. In terms of teaching, I taught uh, uh, eight or nine different courses while I was there, introductory soils, but I also taught advanced courses in, in soil science as well. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's the, the department is about half the size of this department. It is an agronomy department with crops and soils, very close-knit faculty, um, Highly uh, motivated, uh, uh, just like the faculty here. Was What's the it, size of the camp? What's the school there? Well, the campus itself, when I got there, was about 15,000. It's now up to 20,000. Wow. So it's increased an awful sure. lot. So uh-huh. it's about half the size of Purdue. Right. Yeah. It's located in the northwest corner of the state. And so it's, it's very removed from the agricultural, um, row crop agriculture, which is about 200 miles away. So my closest research plots were actually about 250 miles away. Wow. There was a lot of travel. In fact, when I first started at Arkansas, I would uh, we I had research located in three different locations around the state, and I would we didn't have a lot of money for travel, and so I couldn't afford for myself and the graduate students to stay overnight in a, in motels and so forth. So we would pack everything up uh, about once every two or three weeks into a van, uh, leave about four o'clock in the morning. We'd get to our first plots mid-morning. We'd do our measurements. After that, we'd go to the next set of plots, which were about 150 miles away. We did that at three different locations, and we would get back then to Fayetteville. Uh, about uh, It took about a total of 23 hours, so about 3 o'clock the next morning. It was, it was a marathon. Now, that changed with time after I was able to acquire dollars to support our research program. <laughs> But, but it's good to get on the ground, you know, on the ground. You bet. Floor, you you know? just do the things you need to do right. in order to make it work. Get the job done. Get the right. job done. Right. And it was a great experience in Arkansas. Was It was a, a career that I really thought, and my wife did too, that uh, we would we would stay there and retire there. We thoroughly enjoyed Fayetteville, Arkansas. It's a beautiful area. Uh, the people are very hospitable, um, and it was a, a, an outstanding institution. Uh, but Purdue came along, and... You just never know where life is going to take you. Right. Let's talk a little bit about um, you. Had you came in two thousand one as the head of agronomy. I did. Let's, I'll leave it. Take it to uh, what you'd like to share. Are challenges and some of the things that you've done recruitment and. You bet. Yeah. Um, of course, it was a wonderful opportunity to come back to Purdue University, and of course, uh, there were about a third of the faculty um, that were here when I came back had been here when I was a graduate student. So I had already had a, a base of individuals that I, I, I right. knew from past history. Right. But there were two-thirds that were, that were new to me. And it was, uh, it was uh, uh, a, again, a wonderful opportunity to be associated with faculty who I hadn't known before and had an opportunity to get to know them. The thing about the, uh, the department here, uh, unlike other agronomy departments around the nation, is that it is a comprehensive agronomy department. Some agronomy departments um, nationwide are primarily just crop science. And then there might be a soil science department on that same campus. But that soil science department may actually be associated more heavily with geology yeah. than it is with, with right. agronomy. Uh-huh. Uh, here we've, we've, we've uh, maintained a comprehensive department where about half of our faculty are crop scientists and the other half are soil scientists. Intermixed in there and peppered within there we have um, climatologists, we have watershed hydrologists, we have physiologists. I mean, we've got such a, a diverse and eclectic faculty that I, I think of agronomy as more of a microcosm of the entire university than it is truly what one might think of from a traditional right. agriculture right. or agronomy perspective. So we have faculty that we've hired that are engineers or molecular biologists 
or or uh, or truly meteorologists, or you know, very very different backgrounds than than individuals that might have been hired 15 or 20 right. years ago or so. And then, of course, under the JISCI era, where we've had an opportunity to really hire a lot of faculty. Since I've been on board, in the first six years that I was here, we hired 18 faculty. Well, that's three faculty a year. That's a ton of faculty. That's a lot. It is, right. and so it's. It's redefined uh, the department, and we've got a lot of new faces in the department. Uh, it's allowed us to really enter into research and educational areas that we didn't have a presence in before. An example of that is in, in um, watershed hydrology. We didn't have a presence in that. Now we have a, a number of people working in that area. And, uh, and that's, a, that's an important area for research because water is really going to be the commodity that's going to be most limiting not only uh, human growth, but but plant growth and our ability to grow food and so right. forth. So that's a big area. Nanotechnology is a big area for us. And, and five or six years ago, we never had a presence in that as well. Um, um, genomics, plant genomics, where we're actually transferring genes from one plant to another, um, is is new over the past decade or so for us. And so, but we have a very, very strong presence in that. So it's been a wonderful opportunity to really affect some significant change in direction within the right. department. I was talking about um, the, the curriculum. You've also changed the curriculum a lot, too, which brings with, goes along with what you were talking, talking about a moment ago. You bet. Right. I have a book. Um, it's called Field Guide to Academic Leadership by Bob Diamond, Robert Diamond. And, and I had been exposed to Robert Diamond when I was at the University of Arkansas. While I was at the University of Arkansas, I was in, also in Marn Helgeson's position, and so I was co-director of the Teaching and Faculty Support Center. And in that position, which was a university-wide center that supported teaching and, and, uh, and academic endeavors for our faculty, um, I had an opportunity to be exposed to lots of different individuals in a variety of, of, uh, of, of pedagogical expertise. And Bob Diamond is probably the, nation, the national expert, if not an international expert, in curriculum development. And very soon after I got here, I invited Bob to the department and then also to the college uh, with, the, with the perspective of what do we need to do in order to make sure that we have a cutting edge curriculum to offer both our undergraduate and our graduate students. And Bob certainly views curriculum development from an extreme perspective. In other words, his perspective is throw everything out and start from scratch. Well, we weren't really willing to do just that, but what we have done is some major changes within the curriculum. We've added not only uh, new courses, we've redesigned existing curricula in terms of new majors and those kinds of things, but we've also added things that we didn't have, leadership programs in the department, uh, experiential opportunities, much more study abroad, more um, um, uh, uh, electronic learning, um, distance learning, those kinds of things, things that we really didn't have much of a presence in before. And his presence here really helped us with that, kind of rethink things. Sure. And, and the other thing is, um, I truly believe that the curriculum is the purview of the faculty that this is one of those hallmark areas in a, in a university that all faculty really ought to know and understand. And if they don't, it's imperative that, that we make sure that they do get fully engaged. And prior to my coming here, uh, faculty in the department, there were a, a core group of faculty that were engaged in curriculum development, but it wasn't a broad perspective among the faculty. And since then, all of the faculty have been fully engaged. We have retreats that talk about the curriculum. We bring curriculum issues up at the faculty meetings, and they get heavily okay. engaged. We incorporate multiple faculty on committees dealing with curriculum development. We actually have a curriculum committee that we didn't have before. And so I really believe that fundamental to an outstanding organization and institution is the curriculum. That's the backbone. That's why students come here. That's right. And if you don't have a... a a, um, uh, a relevant, cutting-edge curriculum that truly not just trains but educates, then I think that we fail our citizens. Right. And, it, and it's open, and you have to move with the times, and so that sort of fit, fit, fits, fits in with that. You bet. So it has to be dynamic. That's right, yeah. yeah. Um, now, diversity, you, you, you increased uh, women. Talk a little about diversity. Very right? much so. Right. Uh, we've increased the number of female faculty in the department. Uh, when I came on board, I think we had four or five women faculty. Now we've, we have seven or eight. I don't know the exact numbers, but we've increased the, sure. the, the number of female faculty. Uh, we've also increased the number of minority faculty as well from underrepresented groups. And, uh, 
And, and the way that we, we've been able to make that happen, number one, is by being able to do a number of hires. But number two, being much more proactive in our recruitment right. rather than, than passively wait for individuals to apply, really go out and seek out excellent talent. And that excellent talent is represented by multiple groups that are out there, right. not just by a, a single set of, right. of, uh, of, of individuals from a single uh, ethnic background. And so this is how I think an institution and an organization can affect change that way. And we've made some absolutely outstanding hires. And I have to tell you that, uh, that uh, uh, the talent that we have in the department with the, the multiplicity of backgrounds that we have is as good today as we've ever had. Yeah, that's yeah. good. And also, what about the students, too, even? We've, we've been able to affect uh, um, marked change in our graduate student population, and that has been through an aggressive... Um, recruitment as well, really by by being uh, involved in the Manners Organization, which is the, the Minority and Agricultural Natural Resource and Related Sciences Organization, um, and so we're much more heavily involved in that. And then by making contacts with many of the historically black colleges, like like Alabama A and M sure. and and Tuskegee and so forth, and and providing. Uh, opportunities for these students. There are summer research opportunities that get them to Purdue campus and expose them to campus and expose them to the uh, the programs and the people. And we have, and in addition to that, uh, built directly into our strategic plan, it states that that 10 percent of our faculty every year will participate in the uh, multicultural um, educational programs that we have within the College of Agriculture. So we've built that in and our faculty know this and our staff do too. And, uh, and although I don't think that we've reached the 10% level every year, we always have new faculty participating in these. And so uh, I think that you have, to have, you have to have a complete environment to make that happen. We've been less successful at the undergraduate level. And so we've had, we have a, uh, a diversity committee on campus in, in the department that's coordinated by a faculty member, a number of staff, a number of our students. Uh, and they've actually made some contacts with high schools uh, at, in Fort Smith, I'm sorry, Fort Wayne, uh, Indianapolis, and Chicago. And, and our focus now is to try to enhance the student population along those lines as well. So you're working in that direction? We are working in that direction. Which is good. Right? Um, what is your research? You want to talk a little about your research that you've continued on? We talked a little about that earlier. You know what? Uh, I provide uh, support for research here within the department. I don't have an active research program, and, and, I, and I made that decision when I came on board because for a variety of reasons. One, I was hired to be the department head, and I know that there are a number of people who uh, primarily when they come from within the institution and they, they advance to department head, uh, they oftentimes try to, to maintain their research program. It's easier to do that than coming from another institution because I would have to rebuild my, my research program. Um, and then I would also be competing for space with faculty. And space is so limited here uh, that I didn't want to do that as well. So what I do, I serve on graduate student committees. Um, I provide resources for faculty to help them attract graduate students here, so graduate assistantships and those kinds of things. So I can support our broad-based research program by the support that I provide faculty very along good. those lines. That's very good, yeah. yeah. Okay. You've been on a couple of, um, you talked a little about the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, any comments on that? Yeah, we just had a, uh, our, our, every five to six years, the department undergoes an external review. Uh, we yeah, just yeah. had an external review, in fact it was in February, and we had a team of about six individuals from around the United States. They came here for a week. We had prepared for a year and a half for this review. We have, a, I think, a wonderful um, ref self-reflective document that we put together, uh, and they were, they were very, very helpful uh, in terms of uh, providing us guidance for the future. They were also very complimentary about the, the strength of our program, the collegiality of our faculty and our staff, the commitment of our faculty and staff, and, and, and I see it on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and I'm equally awed and impressed with, with the, the people that are here. Uh, but, but one of the things that we did that I'm really pleased and proud of is that the faculty identified six grand challenges that we want to work on collectively, bring our, our, our variety of, a myriad of expertise together to address these grand challenges in addition to the, the many kinds of research areas that we're involved in. And I'll try to list these for you, but uh, uh, 
Uh, one is international agriculture, and we have a very, very strong cadre of faculty here who, who participate internationally, and, and a lot of it in developing countries. And we want to overtly say we're going to be putting resources and people along those lines. Uh, biofuels is another one. Climate change is another area. Contaminants in the environment. Um, plant breeding and genetics is another area. So genetic improvement of economic crops. And then managed landscapes or how we deal with that. And what that means by that is uh, um, when we're dealing with agricultural based kinds of systems, that's a managed landscape. But we want to prevent soil erosion. We want to continue to enhance soil quality and, and water quality. And what are the kinds of research that can be done along those lines? The review team came and we spent one full day talking about these grand challenges. And they had their comment was this is the first time that they had ever seen any organization. Uh, attempt to bring together their collective expertise and overtly say we're going to be working on these and they were they many of the faculty went back and said that they're going to bring this back to their own faculty and say this is the stuff we ought to be doing this is what science is all about so we're pretty excited about it. I would think so that's yeah. great yeah, yeah. <clears throat> you have been on a couple of search committees uh, uh, one for the state chemist you were on the search committee for that and also for the um, the department head of, of uh, botany and plant uh, you chaired that committee yes and just make a comment or two on those uh, great committees um, didn't chair the one for the state chemist but that was one that I was very very pleased about we ended up getting Bob Waltz and uh, he had uh, he brought with us an awful lot of expertise from the state level uh, he was working for the the state of Indiana at the time but he also had a Purdue connection and he's done an outstanding job as a state chemist I couldn't be more delighted and then the other one was uh, I chaired the Botany and Plant Pathology Search Committee for the for the department head, and that's uh, that is uh, uh, Peter Goldsboro is in that position right now, absolutely top quality talent, and and the faculty there are extremely pleased that he is the department head. He's really uh, he's a, he thinks outside of the box, uh, and he's a very engaging individual and a delight to be around, and a great colleague here within the department because both of our departments work very very closely together. Yeah. Very good. Okay, yeah. uh, the uh, centennial. Mm -hmm. That's uh, for the researchers in 2007. They make a couple of comments, and you started that special award, didn't you? Yes, it's the Legends of Agronomy. Right. So there were a number of things that we did for the centennial. Uh, the department was 100 years old in 2007. We couldn't quite figure out exactly when the department started, so I made an executive decision that the department started in 1907. And so we celebrated it in 2007. <laughs> and it was number. plus or minus a day or a year. But um, we actually had uh, uh, several days. We, uh, uh, we worked on this for a year and a half. In fact, you were part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, the library was very, very important to us in terms of helping us uh, archive information and displaying that information and, and uh, making it so that that, re that information was relevant. I mean, this department is, uh, is strong today because of the people that we... That, that have been so important to this Through department the over the years. Right. And, and we've, we've had a very, very strong connection with our, our emeritus faculty. As a matter of fact, um, I, <clears throat> in 2004, we were recognized as a department with the Arthur G. Hansen Award. Uh, and this, is, this was presented to the agronomy department by the president of the university and the Purdue University Retirees Association. We were, I don't know, maybe second, third uh, in terms of receiving this award, but it was in recognition of the, um, uh, the connection that we've maintained with our emeritus and our retired faculty and surviving spouses and all. And as a matter of fact, uh, on an annual basis, I have a luncheon for all of our retirees here in the department just to bring them up to speed and make sure that they feel very, very connected. Well, that was part of what the Centennial was all about. It was to bring people together who were so important for this department, not only the local retirees, but people from all over the United States. So we had m people from multiple states, uh, um, some people from other countries that came to this event. Uh, it was over two and a half days. On a Friday, we had a very nice reception for the the uh, the attendees on Saturday, uh, we had a uh, we had tours of the department. Uh, we had a uh, uh, a series of back to classes 
that our faculty put together and and believe me these were families with small kids that were coming to these we had five or six of these uh, on a on a continuous basis for about a three or four hour period and they loved coming back to class and learning about soils and weather and international agriculture and so forth we had outstanding faculty teaching these classes we had a reception that after that that evening out at the new Beck Center that had uh, uh, only been inaugurated two weeks prior to that on October 29th uh, and then th the next day we actually had a wonderful dinner at the Union and it was a uh, it was a, a very formal event, and that was where we actually recognized our Legends of Agronomy. It was a brand new award. We identified 12 individuals, uh, three of which are still living, so nine had already passed, and the criteria for this award were that these were individuals who truly had an effect on the development of the department and the history of the department. And so we weren't looking for individuals necessarily who had you know, won prestigious awards in their national society and so forth. We were looking for individuals who truly impacted the department. So in addition to some outstanding scientists who truly had been recognized nationally and internationally for their work, we also had individuals like Sandy Spitznagel, who was the administrative assistant, still is, and she had been in this department for 42 years and had impacted the lives of just about everybody who's come through the doors of this department. Uh, Ozzy Lutgemeyer, who had been the, uh, the director of the, the research center just, just west of town, and he had impacted uh, you know, research and, and so forth. And so um, they, were, they were very moved by this. It's an award that um, we had solicited input from all of our alums and friends, and so we had gotten lots of recommendations, and it was a very, very hard decision to make to, to really boil it down to 12. Uh, these are individuals that uh, we actually have a, a bit of a wall of fame uh, in our large conference room where all of these individuals are displayed. Uh, and we're only going to do this award every five years. So it's, um, it's a very uh, prestigious award. Uh, first time we did it was in 2007, so we'll do it in 2012 and, and every five years after that. So well, believe me, there are a number of people that, that hope that they get selected for this award. Right. Uh, let me ask a question. Do you, is it better to spread it out? Some some researchers say, why, why, if you start this, why don't you have it every year? So it's good to spread it out a little bit over time rather than have it on, on a year. I'm sure there was discussion, pros and cons on that. There were, but yeah. you know, if you have it every year, then I think that it, it, uh, it may take away from the... Uh, what I would view to be the prestige of the award. The fact is, we want people to begin th to, to continue to think about this award so that in five years, they're putting together names of individuals that, that they don't necessarily think everyone is entitled to this award. We really want uh, individuals who have truly made a huge impact. The other thing is, um, uh, you want to give it to multiple individuals. And so if you had it every year, how many individuals do you give it to? It, it just becomes complicated. We could have done it that way, but we've decided to do it this way. I, and, think uh, I agree with you. I think that's a wise choice. It's good to spread it out. And, and then you're working on it during the interview. You're working on it. That's right. You're beginning to think about right. it. And, and pe people know about it, and they can be thinking maybe I have somebody or I might even be eligible myself. Right. And here it is, 2009. And what we may do is the end of 2010, send an announcement out again to have people begin thinking about this and then begin submitting names. Right. Yeah, yeah. so that by 2012 we'll have it. Right. That Beck Center, that's on, is that under agronomy or? It's actually, it was I'm agronomy's initiative, oh. uh, but it's under the College of Agriculture. Okay. And the reason for that is that the maintenance of it and the, the scheduling of activities and so forth go way beyond what a department can actually handle. But the proposal was put together soon after I got here. I brought together a group of actually staff members and myself. We crafted a proposal. Uh, we presented it to Vic Lechtenberg, who was the dean at the time. He was very supportive of the idea. The reason we did it uh, primarily was that we, we have been doing what's called the Diagnostic Training Center uh, activities since 1985, and these are field-oriented activities every summer where we actually have mistake plots of corn and soybean and wheat. In other words, uh, we expose consultants to 
what could be problems in the field. So we, we grow corn and soybean with minimal fertilizer, or we may do hail damage to these plots, or we may do insect damage, a lot of different things, planting it, so that when they do get out into the field in the summer, they can already anticipate, well, this is what it would look like, and this is how we might rectify that. So we do this to help consultants with their, their uh, diagnosis in the field. But we've been doing this in the field since 1985 under tents. The actual plots themselves are not intense, but when we bring the classes together on a daily basis, they're under tents. The weather could be horrible, and we can't really do classroom-oriented kinds of instruction. So we've needed a building like this for a long time. So when we made this proposal to the dean, he was very receptive. Um, the lead donor for this was Sonny Beck and Beck Hybrid Seed. Uh, in fact, was the only real donor for this. We were able to acquire existing monies internally to help offset uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the additional cost of the building. We were able to erect a 21,000 square foot building that has five classrooms in it that is absolutely state of the art from an educational delivery uh, facility. And, uh, and it is used ex uh, sometimes on weekends, but I would say almost every day of the week. Not just by the Diagnostic Training Center, but K through 12 education. There are there are uh, community organizations that have asked to use the facility. I mean, it is just a wonderful it's facility. It's great. Yeah. It's, and then that's the purpose of it, not only for the university, but for the community and uh, the other. So it, it generates itself. Yeah. Right. So you can see why we would need somebody. Um, it, it goes beyond the department in terms of the organization of the use of the building. Right. Otherwise, you'd require a full-time person. Uh, just to do scheduling. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Let's talk a couple about your awards. You got that food systems leadership. You're mm -hmm. a fellow of that, and also the a fellow of the soil science, which is nice. Yeah. Um, and 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 I was very pleased with both of those. So the fellow of the Soil Science Society of America uh, came a few years ago and. And, you know, that's where you're recognized by your colleagues within your scientific community. And you've been very active in the NAB Association. I have, right. yeah, both in the American Society of Agronomy and the Soil Science Society of America. Uh, it's an organization that, uh, this is how I remain connected to science and, and also expose my graduate students to the network of scientists that are out there as well. So uh, although I don't fully engage in, in the science of soils uh, on, an, on a daily basis, uh, I do interact and try to keep up with the science in a variety of ways. This is one of them. With regards to the Food Systems Leadership Institute, uh, the inaugural class of that was uh, the first year that I participated in this. And Randy Woodson, the dean at the time, asked me if I would be interested. He was, he was interested in uh, nominating me for this, and I uh, was accepted into the program. It's a program that is jointly sponsored by uh, the Kellogg Foundation and, and an organization called Nostalgic which is the National Association of State Universities and Land-Grant Colleges, which is essentially the main representative group for a consortium of about 250 um, institutions of higher learning around the United States. They're headquartered in Washington, D.C. And the intent of this organization, this leadership, is very different than other leadership or um, uh, uh, programs. It is intended to, to develop individuals who will develop into high-level leaders within institutions. And so when I started down this road with the food systems leadership, uh, my intent was to stay as a department head for a few years and probably uh, go back into the faculty. Uh, after having participated in food systems leadership, it got me thinking about other opportunities. And, and it really networks you with, with other deans and provosts and presidents. You're exposed to lots of different people from around the United States and in various leadership uh, levels, and you have opportunities to be mentored by them, which, which I had been. It's a real high-level uh, um, program. It's a heavy commitment. It's a two-year commitment. Uh, but I came back out of that very, very changed, and it really redirected my thinking. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Um, you know, quite a few professional associations, and your that cooperative extension service. You've been an, an advisor for that. Yes. So, and others as well as the American Association of Advancement of Science. Yes. And you kept very active professionally as well. I have tried to. Yeah. Right. And sure the cooperative that. extension is one that's very important to me because we have a number of extension specialists in the department. Engagement and outreach is an important part of right. what we do. It's part of our three threefold mission of a of a land grant institution. Uh, and this has allowed me to uh, fully engage with our, our faculty and many of our staff in extension and ensure that we have uh, uh, relevant 
oper uh, relevant information that we convey to the general public. Yeah, which is good. Yeah. Uh, you got a uh, Purdue tradition? I'm sorry? Uh, do you have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? A Purdue tradition that I would like to share with you? Um, that's a real interesting question. I mean, I do a number of things at Purdue. Is there a Purdue tradition? Catherine, um, I, I, I oh. guess the biggest tradition is that uh, is is the the generational legacy that we have developed uh, through Purdue, and so my wife's father went to Purdue for a year. Uh, I ended up getting my degree at Purdue. Our children now are getting their degrees at Purdue, and they're talking about their kids getting their degrees at Purdue, no matter where they're at. So that's about the best tradition that you Sounds can have, I think. <laughs> yeah. How about an outstanding event? And does that come to mind? Anything that you'd like to share? Well, besides the centennial, which I'm really, really pleased at how that came out, and and we still get feedback on how wonderful that that event actually was. But you know, there are a number of things that we've done here that I'm very proud of. Um, one, and uh, certainly the Beck Center is one that we're very, very proud of, and and uh, and that that truly makes that research facility both a research and educational facility out at the farm. Uh, but I started the Agronomy Ambassadors Program while I was here as well, and that's one where uh, this is that leadership that I was talking to you about that I, I recognize that our students, uh, as part of their educational programming, really needed to develop the leadership side of their, their, uh, their, their qualities and characteristics. And, and we, we had it, but not very overtly. In other words, we have a number of student organizations in the department, like the Agronomy Club and the Environmental Science Club and so forth, and students can get involved in officer level right, exactly. activities, like many clubs. Like many clubs, but but there was nothing that was really developing them along those lines. It was really a strategy, and so we developed the agronomy ambassadors. And every year, then we select about fourteen students, and it's very very competitive. Students have to apply, they have to interview, they have to uh, uh, go through a, a whole program of, of fairly high level selection. They're selected for this. Uh, and then they go through almost a full year of orientation, and it orients them not only to all of the, uh, I think, the, the wonderful opportunities and the facilities within the department, but we orient them to the college, we orient them to the university. Uh, Anthony, um, uh, the president's uh, person yeah, over in Westwood, yeah. comes over and exposes our students to uh, etiquette. And so they get exposed to that as well. And these students then represent us with all VIPs that come into the department, any student that's interested, any, any parents that are here and so forth. Uh, they participate at the uh, fish fry, the agricultural fish fry. Um, they participate in a lot of different functions around campus. So they get exposed to a lot of leadership as well. And they are changed because a number of them now have, uh, uh, are participating in student government. Uh, both at the college level and at the university level as well. So we're seeing them develop their leadership skills and think a little bit differently. So I'm very, very proud of that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, the, in closing, I'm going to let you make some closing comments, but I also, for the researchers, the next stage, you might just want to make a comment on that. It's going to be moving to the house, elsewhere. You mean as far as... You're leaving university. You're what next, I'm going to be stage. doing? Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I'm leaving here to become dean at the, of the College of Agricultural Sciences at Colorado State University. And, and this is a, a direct result of not only the experiences that I've had here, and this has been just a wonderful environment for me to, to learn more about um, uh, how one does provide leadership for a, a, an educational organization like a department and, and how you integrate with, uh, with other departments and other colleges. Uh, but it's, it's, it's allowed me to think a little bit differently about myself as well and maybe some opportunities that are there that I didn't recognize and realize prior to being at Purdue University. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to that. I start that in July, and I'm already getting engaged with uh, stakeholders in Colorado and many of the faculty. And, and I'll be traveling to Colorado State a couple of times between now and July and interacting with faculty there and try to hit the ground running and interacting with some of the stakeholders. With regards to... to um, uh, final comments, I will just say that, that um, Purdue University uh, has been a very, very important part of my life, uh, both as a graduate student uh, when I was here in, in 78 to 84, 
Uh, a number of people who were there then and are here now were, have been continue to be important parts of my life. Uh, George Van Scoy, for one, Bill McPhee is another one, uh, Jim Ulrichs, uh, outstanding individuals and people that I really do uh, um, even today rely very heavily on and they're very, very willing to provide their time and talent uh, to helping me and, and uh, helping the organization move forward. As far as an organization, I've never been associated with an organization that is as um, dedicated and motivated and has the enthusiasm collectively as the people that make up Purdue University. Purdue is a, a very, very special place. And, and I think that as one travels around the United States and they see that, uh, that there are a number of institutions where people just don't function very well together, uh, there may not be the kind of administrative support that you would like to see. Purdue is completely opposite of that. I mean, administration and faculty and staff work very, very well together. Um, they're, they're highly motivated. They're focused on, on impact, impacting students, impacting the people who seek information from us. Uh, we take it very seriously. And so uh, from the standpoint of an organization that I truly believe impacts not only uh, Indiana, the nation, and the world, Purdue University is second to none. I'm, I feel very fortunate to have been associated with Purdue. I'll always be associated with Purdue no matter where I'm at. Um, and who knows, someday I may end up coming back to Purdue. You never know where life is going to take you. That's right. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Professor. You bet. Very much.